cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Jason, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. Hey, it's uh, it's an honor. I'm excited to talk. Yeah, uh, you know, it was amazing to to chat with you a little bit last month when you were here in Oregon to uh, uh, you know the Oregon premiere of Cup of Salvation. That was that was an amazing film. That was a that was a lot of fun. Honestly, I had uh, man to have hundreds of people in a room like that where we actually filmed the movie was really special. Yeah, I I can I can only imagine. Uh, later on, we'll kind of circle back around for you know for Cup of Salvation. But the one of the like questions that have just been on the top of tip of my tongue. Uh, I know Michael Mann is your favorite director, and <laughs> you were super excited when he uh, launched uh, Heat Two. You know the the book, right? I'm not going to lie to you. I'm so excited you're starting with Michael Mann. This is amazing. Okay, yes. I was very <laughs> pumped about that book. <laughs> this is a, yeah, this podcast I, just I, got even better. Awesome. I I'm just curious, what did you think of the of the book itself? Did it did it do was it justice? Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. I uh pre-ordered it the minute it was available and uh I thought it was great. I uh honestly, they could have released something a tenth of the quality of what that was. And I'd have been happy. So the fact that it actually really was, you know, lived up. Yeah. My first thought was, do you know how bad I want to see a sequel to heat? And so you know, apparently Michael Mann's working on making the movie. And so my, the problem is I read the, I read the book thinking about how are they going to make this movie considering a lot of the characters are too old or, you know, how they're going to recast a young Macaulay or whatever. So but yeah, right. I, I loved it. Man, am I happy you're talking about something like <laughs> uh, like uh, the movie Heat or the the book Heat too. <laughs> uh, you know, I I, I love that movie. I uh, there's always there's a scene in the first you know in the in the movie itself you know where they're you know robbing the bank and it's the you know it's the gunfight at the end mm-hmm. and, you know and one of the characters grabs one of the little girls. I so want to create a character. Yes. I so want to create a story of like what happens to that little girl's life from that point forward. I think that would be so amazing. This is a phenomenal idea. I love this. I, uh, yeah, I never God, I never thought about that. I mean, that is like one of the most evil things in the film is when he takes that little girl as like a human body shield. And, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's not, not that Tom Sizemore's character in the movie heat was a upstanding human being, but that being said, uh, that was a pretty awful thing. Where let me ask you to spoil your uh, idea. Where where is this little girl now? She's in her what? She would be Ooh. in her thirties now. Yeah, so probably. somewhere that yeah, they're about. I would it would just be curious to like explore that avenue to see what what happens to her. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting too if Michael Mann. Michael Mann has a complicated thing with female characters in his film, so I'd love to see him direct a film about some you know young district attorney who is the girl, you know picked up by tom sizemore during a giant shootout in downtown los angeles i mean look at i'm telling you put that in my veins right now i'm in yeah yeah no i i would agree um you know so you know i i talked a little bit with uh philippe andre and he's like hey are we ready to to shoot psalm five you know and it would be like directors and ferraris getting champagne yeah philippe andre in his cars i was actually texting him uh, the other day, Philippe Andre is a, is a very, very wonderful guy based in Chicago who, who, uh, who reps at one of the great champagne companies. He, uh, he, I, I, to put him in a Ferrari doing anything with wine, I'm in, and he has certainly found a way to mix his cars with wine in a way that yeah. I'm very impressed. Yeah. He is, uh, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. I'm, he is. You know, if you would have told me I was going to make a Psalm three, let alone four, I'd have, I'd have told you there's no chance. So. Who knows? We have several films in production and one of them might end up being a sound film. So, you know, I don't know yeah. if it'll have Ferraris, but. <laughs> well, you know, well, we got to get uh, Philippe Andre on, you know, on that. I mean, he was, he was here at uh, IPNC here in Oregon, uh, not this past summer, but the previous. And man, the energy he has is just phenomenal. He's, he is an amazing guy. Yeah, he really is. Yeah. Philippe's a good guy. Really good guy. Yeah. 
Uh, going back a little bit before Heat, uh, you know, you've you've mentioned like uh, a documentary that inspired you for Psalm was Pumping Iron. Yeah. And but and I'm trying to do the math, right? Pumping Iron came out in '77. Mm-hmm. And when did you come about and even hear about Pumping Iron? I mean, you had to be like a wee little baby or something, right? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm looking at the VHS uh, of my father's copy of Pumping Iron. So Pumping Iron was a film my father was a very big fan of. And uh, when I was young, probably five, six years old, I watched the film for the first time. And then I watched it again and again and again and again. And my dad bought a VHS of it back when VHSs cost, they were hundreds of, they were like $170, oh, yeah. $160. This is like something that I, I don't think young people could really fathom at the moment of like spending, you know, almost $200 on one movie back when $200 was a lot more money than it is now. Um, I grew up with this film and I, I honestly think for a lot of purpose, pumping iron is one of the first documentaries that was meant to be entertaining. You know, it was not meant to be this film that was like, here, you're going to learn something. You're going to see how a tribe in the Amazon lives. You're going to see, you know, X, Y, Z, there are, there are examples prior, but from a mainstream standpoint where you got introduced to characters that now obviously have aged very well, you have Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno and all of these people who have been very important for so many, I watched Total Recall last night. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think, I think that that particular movie from a story standpoint, where you have real characters, they're they're three dimensional. I mean, they might be idiots at occasionally and they might be vulgar and whatever else, but you get to follow it through in a kind of, you know, sports horse race type manner of who's going to win in the end. But also you get to live with these people in their houses. You get to watch them give each other shit. Um, I I think it's an unparalleled film. And still to this moment, I think it's one of the funniest, most entertaining. You know, it's tough to even call it a documentary because it plays like a narrative. I I was introduced to it very young. And bias aside, I still think it's one of the great films of the medium. I love it very, very much. I watch it all the time. And without that film, I never would have made some. There's no chance. Some is directly modeled after that. I, I can imagine your, your daughters, do they have any opinion on, on the movie pumping iron? <laughs> I, you know, my <laughs> oldest has definitely seen it. Um, it. It's, you don't realize how inappropriate a film is until you watch it with your children. And oh, uh, yeah. it's one of the movies where Schwarzenegger is definitely, uh, I mean, look, he had some fun to say the least. And uh, you know, as we know of his personal life and everything else, but the seeds are all there in that film. And, you know, I did watch it with my daughter a couple of years ago and her comment was like, so why do these guys want huge muscles? Like, what's the reason? And I'm like, well, what do you mean? What's the reason? The reason is to get huge yeah. muscles. And she's like, yeah, but what's the reason after that? And I'm like, Hmm. Yeah. Men are not good. Men are, men are interesting characters. So I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question, but um, right. her response was basically just, why <laughs> which i think is a valid that's a valid response to pumping iron i think it, i you know I, I think so too there's uh i went to so my daughter's 15 and you know over halloween i was going to introduce her to you know you know to some horror movies and you know brought up some mm-hmm. classics and just you know this the first scene of one movie you know was complete nudity and i'm like what which movie which movie halloween Oh, how, oh, Halloween itself, John Carpenter's. Yeah. 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 But I mean, but you know, at that time you kind of had to have nudity in in order for a film to be legitimate in the horror space, you kind of had to have, I mean, that movie has some just like, why the hell is this person naked kind of moments in it. But at the same time, John Carpenter is probably one of my top five directors of all time. So, you know, and that film is a miraculous thing. I don't know that I would show it to my daughter. It's pretty scary. Um, though I watched it when I was probably seven, so I don't, I don't exactly know, you know, right. Different time. I mean, it's just di- different times, which is just crazy to to you know reflect back onto that. That's right. Um, you know, I I a couple years ago I was interviewing Andy Lytle for the podcast, sure, and he told me this amazing story of how sparklers ended up happening at his property at the Joy. Yeah, and uh. He proceeded to tell me that, you know, he was sending out bottles of Lytle Barnett 
uh, to, uh, you know, some San Francisco restaurants. Uh, and uh, Matt Kaner ended up getting the bottle mm-hmm. and, he, you know, called Andy. It's like, this is fabulous. This is great. And then, you know, got to talking about uh, just having a conversation. And he's like, okay, you need to be on your phone in like 10 minutes. And so pick up the, you know, that happened, pick it up the phone and you're on the other end. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, first of all, Andy is uh, Andy's a truly great person. Uh, the the other amazing thing is he makes one of the best sparkling wines in easily in North America. I mean, Lytle Barnett, and I got to give Matt Kaner a tremendous amount of credit for this. Matt, Matt called me and he's like, you need to try this wine. And so I was able to try it and I was blown away. You know, I was truly blown away. This is, it's I'm surprised that the wine is not, I, I know it's well-known, but it should be more well-known. It's really, really good. I mean, it has a, a character that you can only find in certain parts of Champagne. You know, this very dry yeasty thing that is not common in the U S what, what Andy has done with sparkling is truly magnificent. So, um, honestly, when I tasted, I was like, Hold, can we get this wine in the episode? It was not even, it wasn't like, a you're lucky to be in our show. It was more like, how do we put you in the show? Because I, I honestly, when you have a wine that's that good and you see it on screen, if you've watched sparklers, we were lucky that show was nominated for James Beard. It did, you know, it did very well for some TV, but when you see the people tasting it in that thing, you realize like th- there's no, there's no bullshit here. This wine is truly great. Um, Andy is, yeah. uh, yeah, they're, they're doing, doing the Lord's work. I can't, we're, we want to do a season two of sparklers. So that's, in the works at the moment. Um, yeah, I, it back. I want I want his rosé in it. It's really good. It is. It is really good. And I, I have to say, I'm very much looking forward to, to season two of sparklers. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Trust me. It's, uh, uh, the process of getting these things greenlit and moving through and having the time to do them. And you know, it's a, it's a process. And I know that there's a lot of people who are like, where the hell are these shows you promised, but eh, we're working on it. I swear. Yes, I, I I know that you are. And uh, early early on in your career, you were working on a documentary in the Lake of the Ozarks in Missouri, and it was on a snail that was going how, extinct. How did you know this? How did you know this? <laughs> I do my research. You know, it's funny. I that so that. Uh, anyways, go on. But I'll, I, 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 I well, no, go, go, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, yeah, that's the first documentary film probably that I ever shot, and it's never been edited. So believe it or not, I have all the stuff down here right below me in this cabinet. And I've been talking a lot recently about getting that together. I mean, this is a story about a man named Tom Ailey who lives in a town called Proto, Missouri, and it's in Karst country. So it's like this limestone cavernous area, lots of caves. And under his house is a particular cave. And in this particular cave is a stream. And in this particular stream is a snail that is averages the size of a grain of sand. And Ooh. it lives nowhere else in the world. And now it can get a little bigger. You can find it to be like the size of a gut. I'm trying to think like what a good example would be like a lentil maybe. But like for the most part, it's very tiny and it lives nowhere else in the world. Nowhere else in the world. Imagine the responsibility. You are a naturalist. He, he is Tom Ailey. And he discovers under his property is this snail that lives nowhere else in the world, serves no function to society. It doesn't like produce energy. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't feed humans. It's not a thing that people would want to save. And yet there's like a hundred of them in the world and they live only below his house. And so, you know, I, my career sort of started nature documentaries and I went there to film the idea of what if this was part of something, I have a nature documentary series that I almost it was going to happen at PBS. And then for a number of reasons got, got shut down uh, while I was in the Galapagos filming, believe it or not, but it's called walking softly. And it's about the concept of animal extinction and the idea of something being truly gone and what that means. It's different when you have a single animal and it dies and, but it's a completely different thing when a whole species goes away. And so this snail yeah. I find to be very fascinating because what's its purpose to humans. And so this, right. that's what this film is. I, I'm so curious how you knew that I even made this film. I, I barely ever talked about it 
or at least shot uh, the was... film. I've not edited the film, but shot the film. Right. <laughs> right. No, I, 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 you know, the, the, the internet is vast. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the internet is vast. I gotta be careful. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we are going to edit that. I mean, I, I am, I have been side-eyeing the footage down there for a long time. And uh, it's an interesting film. One where I would have directed it in the very naissance of my career and yet edited it when I have some experience under my belt. It's going to be interesting to see what that turns out to be. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm curious to, to if it comes out. And, you know, I was just, oh, I was just wanting to. I was wanting to know if that, uh, <clears throat> you know, diving into into that documentary and snails, if that kind of brought some inspiration to the the snail caviar for that episode of uh, Sparklers. <laughs> yeah, I pro- God maybe maybe subconsciously I think I I, I like weird food very much, right. and the idea of snail caviar was one that I had had snail I had had snail caviar maybe a decade ago. Um, randomly i was in god i was in europe filming a travel show believe it or not and this was offered as part of a dish and they brought it out as like this separate thing and they were like what do you think about this and it blew me away i was like eating i I know on sparklers they they didn't love the taste of it Mm -hmm. i disagree i i think it tastes like uh you know to eat something that tastes like wet moss but has an umami element to it you know, mushroomy, wet moss. And you would think that those aren't, aren't food characteristics, but paired with the right champagne, the right stuff, I think it really is. And uh, I thought it was fascinating. So I really wanted to find a way to put it in something or figure it out. I even thought about making an actual film on how people are breeding snails for their eggs. It's a really intricate process, very expensive delicacy. And so, you know, fascinating, but it's interesting. <laughs> Maybe subconsciously for sure. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I I could only imagine the process to get snail caviar. <clears throat> I just I can't even I can't even get my head around that one at all. Yeah, you gotta you know you put on some Marvin Gaye, you get the right snails in the right room, <laughs> you know, have the right lighting. You know, it's a I think it, it's a pain in the ass. They don't lay a lot of eggs. Um, these these snails, and I think as far as I understand, they're the same snails you would eat, you know, in a French bistro or something, you know. Right. But. But that being said, uh, getting them to lay their eggs, and I think you have to harvest them really quickly. They have to be harvested immediately. And so it's pretty much all farmed. It's, you know, you're a crazy person to make this your career, pretty much. I, you're gonna do. Yeah, that, that would be way worse than wine, in my opinion. Uh, documentary <laughs> filmmaking is definitely, definitely uh, as tough as snail egg farming, I think. It's pretty much the same, same concept, I think. Yeah, it, it could be, game. it could, <laughs> yes. Um, so I, I reached out to, to Matt Kaner and to, to Meg, you know, for a couple questions and Matt was just, he said, uh, so why, why did you move the, the kitchen outside, you know, after at, at the joy for the last couple what episodes? It, you know, well, we at, at the joy, I mean, we had the kitchen outside. We moved to Sonoma was when we had the kitchen outside mostly. Um, and that really, you know, outside of the, at the joy, we allowed people to cook outside for the first, what was it? Six episodes, I believe seven. And, uh, but a lot of this comes down to just where visually it looks good to film. And that's, that's interesting because at the joy is beautiful inside. Nice right. and quiet. It's a, it's a gorgeous property, but the weather was terrible when we were there. It was freezing at night. It was raining oh, yeah, a lot. Yeah. And so we didn't do a lot outside there. When we went to Sonoma, uh, we were able to, the weather was great, but the space inside was tough. So the kitchen was more of a staff kitchen. It was not like a kitchen you would use for camera. And so we brought in essentially much to the dismay of our contestants. We brought in these like outdoor grills, which were a pain in the ass in the wind and all this stuff, but they had to deal with it. Um, but that's why we went outside just visually because it looked better and it felt better and there was more space because when you do these shows one thing you don't see on camera is how frankly dangerous it is for people to be running back and forth with knives in their hands and you don't you can't tell on camera but a lot of these spaces are enclosed and you know this was a safer environment to film outside i'm sure i know matt had a lot of problems with the wind but matt did a 
Matt did a great job on that show. He was really, really, really stupendous. Um, yeah, and he's yeah. a really good cook. And he didn't he didn't expect to end up being a cook on the show. And he really rolled with the punches and did a great job on it. You know. Yeah. No, he he did. I I think everybody did a fantastic job. Yeah. Well, it makes me so happy yeah. that you watched the show. It was, uh, I'm very proud of it. Oh, I I was so excited. I was watching it every every week. No, well, uh, next season will be a lot of fun. Yes. Uh, and if there's something that I can do on, on this end, or if you need any contestants or anything, you know, Hey, reach out. I'll, I will. I'll be definitely, a, we uh, probably need all the help we can get knowing, knowing the way this stuff goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question that Meg had was, uh, you know, the harmony with everyone in the show was absolutely spectacular, but how did you end up convincing everybody to be on the show? Yeah, I don't know. That's uh, I'm good at that. Um, I'm good at getting people to jump out of an airplane and then build the parachute on the way down. I think, you know, Meg was one that, you know, I have to say, like, the, the show wouldn't have happened without Meg. And, you know, I really wanted Claire in it, too. The two of them were, and George and Matt. I mean, it's tough. All of them were very handpicked. And it goes back to the way Psalm happened um, when we did Psalm 1. It was basically like these couple people are studying with each other and ancillary. They're studying with somebody kind of far away occasionally. And it allowed us to sort of cast the right people in Psalm one based on who they were kind of already working with. And we could sort of nudge them to work more with people. Whereas with sparklers, I, I wanted a different environment. I wanted an environment of, you know, competition, but where they supported each other, there was a kind of element of like, people were not trying to, upend others people truly liked everybody there and i know that sounds weird but i really didn't want the like animosity that a lot of these these cooking shows have you know at the end a lot of people don't talk to each other not always not you know but in some cases it can be contentious afterwards and so the, the people were casted and obviously i had no backup plan so anybody they weren't allowed to say no i just because what was i going to do if they said no i mean right george is one of the kindest people in the world. Meg is exactly the same, but she doesn't take shit from anybody. Claire is one of the more innovative and think on her feet people I've ever met. Mary Ahmed is very similar, but she is, you know, she is a self starter, does not mess around with what her goals are in life. And when you get all of the, and, and then Kaner, of course, is he's a walking businessman. You know, he really cares deeply about everyone he works with, but he's trying a lot of things at a lot of times. And so, it was like, if I were to put all these people in a situation who all know each other, who all like each other, um, how good would that be? And so I just didn't want there to be a back out plan for anybody because honestly it was the middle of COVID, you know, we were sort of in a bubble filming this and I just didn't want, you know, I just didn't want to give them an out. So the answer is I didn't give a, I didn't have a backup plan. I had to, they had to say yes or else I wouldn't have had a show. So, you know, I pushed them into it, you know, right. so yeah yeah no it, it's it's very cool and i you know it is amazing you know even after you know sparklers was done how the you know the whole gang is you know they still are you know there, there's a bond there that's with them forever i think so too yeah and that's 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 one of the great things with doing a show like this i remember press asking us various press would be like you know so tell me about do they still talk to each other I would assume they don't like each other. And I'm like, based on what? And they were like, well, most, most competition shows, you have a lot of animosity coming out. And I was like, you know, our producers were, you know, me, you know, I was producing it live and, you know, there were, you know, Christina, who's my wife was producing it and Jackson who shot it was producing it. And we cared about these people. And so there was not like, not like a normal reality show where you're writing or working to get people to have problems with each other. Like we had, we didn't have that for our thing. It was more like I knew these were competitive people. So that was going to work anyway. You know, they want to win and they want to be good at what they're doing. And some of them, there were various levels of cooking ability, but honestly, the fact that they are all still friends and I know they really are is truly like one of the great things that came out of that first season. And second season, we're going to bring in a lot more celebrity aspect. There are some pretty amazing people who have signed on. Joel McHale uh, has signed on to be a, a judge and others. And so, you know, we have to work that in. But, you know, finding a cast that can equal what that previous cast was is going to be tricky. 
we're going to have it, to work it, hard. That's going to be very tricky. I mean, when y'all went to the James Beard Awards, I mean, everyone was taking <laughs> pictures of everybody. Philippe Andre came over to the table. I mean, it I was know. it was quite spectacular. It was a lot of fun. It was really special. You know, I mean, unfortunately, some very tiny upstart show called Top Chef beat us, but that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. You know, it was uh, it was very special. And you know, you look, I look back at that, and it's like how lucky it is to be able to do this at all. It's really amazing. Yeah, it it is amazing. And when you um, when you started to do Psalm itself, you were originally you know doing a World War One uh, champagne movie, and you're at the Morton Steakhouse, and you know there's Brian McClintock, you know, and he was you know you're talking to him, you know, he's doing this Master Psalm course, and you know you attended some of the Master blind tastings that they were doing, yep, and what grabbed you was not the the blind tastings and how they're calling it. It was just like at once they're done with like the blind tasting, just giving each other all the shit and all the shit talking. That's sure. what kind of drew you in. Right. Yeah. I mean, that goes back to pumping iron. I mean, the idea that, you know, I, I think in 2023 it's like, and even then it was probably inappropriate to have a film about guys acting like guys with each other. It's like, immediately everybody when you when you have something like that there's an element of like you know is this okay it's not okay it's and understandably i mean it's not like i'm i'm saying that that should be okay i'm just saying there was an element of like but what i saw in the way they behaved was the way i had seen in sports when i played sports what i had seen in i mean pumping iron is a perfect example when i saw you know pumping iron they're competitive. They sort of support each other, but they also really give each other a lot of shit. And, you know, I think a lot of young men who grow up with other guys who are their friends, it's, you sort of show you care by giving each other shit and whether that's right or wrong, I'm not here to say, but that's what I grew up with. And those friends are still my best friends now that I grew up with. And so for me, I kind of come at it from that angle. And I saw a bit of a sports film here, you know, and I saw, like I said, how much I loved, pumping iron i saw that possible template and of course some took years and years and we had no money to make it it was a whole process but that being said it's uh god it's crazy that that film did what it did and worked and actually happened but yeah brian mcclintock was the in but it was ian cobble who made the film you know what it was i mean somebody who was willing to get in a warm bathtub and open up their veins to pass, to pass an exam, <laughs> similar to how I felt about making my first film. I mean, I would have done anything to do this. So it was, right. you know, to have a subject like that is really rare. I think it's once every, you know, five, 10, 20 years, you get somebody who is that dedicated to anything in life, let alone, you know, my film is, he would have done that anyway. So it's one thing to look at the movie and, you know, you think, those people exist for the film, but they would have done that anyway. So it's really special to have that kind of dedication. I think it, it is. And, you know, you're saying that, you know, to, to have, uh, you know, something happen and meet somebody to like really kind of change, you know, the, the course that you were on. I mean, that's kind of what happened with cup of salvation as well. Yeah. To a even more, you know, a bigger degree. Um, I mean, look, Cup of Salvation is uh, a very special film. It's a movie that uh, I've wanted to make for my entire life. You know, when I walked into, there's, I think there's this moment, I don't remember when it happened for sure. It's not like I stood in front of a mirror and said, I will be a filmmaker. But there was a moment where I was like, I'm going to throw everything I have at this. Because if you don't, you will not be a filmmaker. It is literally you know, in my life, and I can only speak of speak to what I've done. It's the hardest. It's the hardest thing in the world. Nobody wants you to make a film. Nobody wants you to do it. Nobody wants to give you money. Nobody wants to wait as long as it takes to do it right. Nobody wants to give you the spontaneous things that are needed. You know, um, it's 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 an impossible task if you have a backup plan. So you cannot have any backup plan. But since the beginning. Even before Sam, I mean, I've loved history. I love, um, I love the idea of how history repeats itself. I love the idea of, you know, humans having an ultimate 
goal of hope. And I really, really, really wanted to make a film like cup of salvation well before I ever made a movie. And so the opportunity to make this film was, I mean, it's the greatest opportunity I've ever had. I don't know. I don't know how the film will do. I don't know if it's going to make its money back. You never, this stuff is like, if you go into a film where you're making a film like this, you will fail. If you think about that stuff, it's impossible. But with this, I set out to make a film about the origin of wine and religion. And we were accomplishing that. I lobbied the Vatican for a long time. We filmed in the secret archives. Uh, we filmed in Pompeii, Mount Vesuvius, Dominican Republic, Argentina, all these places. And, you know, some of the most beautiful stuff we've ever shot, probably the most beautiful stuff we've ever shot. But when I got to Armenia, which was just supposed to be the beginning and the end of this movie, not the whole movie, it was going to be just the beginning and the end. And I met Vahe Kashgarian. I met his daughter, Amy, and uh, the whole film flipped on its head. I mean, we, we, I realized quickly this was a person much like Ian, but in a very different vein who was going to do something no matter what anybody told him was possible. And on top of that, you know, he was faced with truly serious things. I mean, life, you know, life affecting things like, you know, wars and geopolitics that go back to deep religious fervor and things. And so, yeah, I mean, that's a long answer to your, to your statement, but yeah, it's, um, cup of salvation is something that I will, I will be proud of to my grave that it actually saw the light of day because nobody wanted to see a film or knew they wanted to see a film, about Armenian wine history or Persian wine history or, you know, geopolitics and wine. And it's not up to me whether it succeeded or not. It's up to you and audiences, but yeah. Yeah. Long yeah, answer. Short. I, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's a great answer. I, I can't even imagine, you know, when, when you were doing your, your first, very first film and Bill failure, uh, gave you a, a check for $3,000 when you only asked for two, yeah, Bill, um, yeah. that I, I can never, like, when you did that, like the idea of casting or directing a movie and people are actually having to wear a bulletproof vest that that ever even like mm. even went, went through your head like that. Like I, I'll never do it. I, I'll never have to worry about, you know, somebody's safety of that nature. But with this film, there was just so many things going on. Yeah. It's, you know, I think this film, it's funny. I've been living it now for so long that it feels like it's been going for a long period. And most people haven't seen it yet. I mean, unless you were at a screening, unless you were in New York or LA or in Philadelphia or some place that you could be at that one place for that one night, very few people have seen it. And as we record, I have to make a very difficult decision on how we're going to release it digitally because on one side we can actually make money on the other side, a lot of people will see it. And those often, those two Venn diagrams, they don't often overlap. And so Literally, when we're done recording, I have to make one of the most difficult decisions for this film. But I think when it comes to the nuts and bolts of people's lives being in danger, you know, the, uh, you know, the bulletproof vests and the uh, what's the Iranian government going to do and all of these little things, they're why I wanted to be a filmmaker. The fact that we have these conundrums and have to figure it out, it's the reason. I mean, it's the reason you want to walk into this because... Look, what Amy and Vahe were doing and what, you know, Mo Mumtazi over at Mesara and what, you know, his family is doing, it was already as important as it was before the movie. The movie just gets to show people how important or at least a fraction of kind of how important what they're doing actually is. And so I, I you know, did I expect to do this? Yeah, sure. I mean, I almost died making a film about sea urchin divers, you know, uh, when I was filming underwater. I've always been stupid when it comes to <laughs> putting my body and my life at risk. I just don't want to put my subjects at risk. And so this was the first film where I've been very worried about the people in it. You know, in Psalm 1, it's like, you know, look, if you don't become a master sommelier, you can get a job in something else. You're going to be fine. Right. You know, you might get divorced right. because, you know, of the process or something, but like <laughs> you're going to live. 
this film has like repercussions that are much deeper and much more serious. And that's good. Film should have that. Uh, I just hope that enough people see it so that it's justified for what we went through. We'll see yeah, how that yeah, goes. I, yeah. I, I'm right there with you. I know that you were, when they, uh, you know, were actually in Iran, you were doing, you know, remote directing via WhatsApp. And, mm-hmm. you know, there was times where, you know, Vahi didn't have any reception or anything. I can only imagine what, like what you, what your nerves were doing at that point. I mean, that just, that had to have been hard. It's very scary. Um, you know, I mean, remote directing sounds like a total, uh, you know, conundrum of like, how do you remote direct? But to be honest with you, directing, especially a documentary, but anything is there's a lot of people on narrative feature films who direct from behind a bunch of screens, the room over. You know, that's like commonplace for like a Marvel film or something like that. So right. there's really no difference. There's really no difference between that and what I did, except for what I did had, you know, real nervous energy for what was going to happen for the people on camera. Now, Fahe is no, Fahe is not like someone who needs my, my worry. He is a strong guy and knows what he's doing and can speak several languages and, you know, is a, is a, a much smarter person than I am. It doesn't mean that I didn't worry about him and still don't. And, you know, especially Amy, who I think is a a long line of very talented women who get put into a lot of shit because of men who want to do crazy stuff. But Amy is somebody who I think in 10 years, we'll be talking about her as one of the most talented winemakers in the world, let alone in a country that deserves the credit. So yeah, it, it, it's a weird process to go through, but I am still nervous for everybody because the minute I take my guard down and I'm working on other movies is when something weird could happen with this film. You just get the right person with the wrong perspective on what it was about and you just don't know. But I will say this, the the film itself is a very hopeful movie. I think that it's a great father-daughter story. At least I hope it is. Um, and... You know, yeah, it's a weird process to go to go through, especially the Iran thing. If I could have been in Iran, I'd have been there. I mean, there's not I would stand with a camera in my hand for any film I ever shoot, any shot, anything. But I'd still be in Iran if I had done that. I'd be probably in jail. So (laughs) it's a certain point. You got to weigh your uh, (laughs) you got to weigh that stuff. (laughs) Yeah, yes, yes, you do. Um, you know, you're talking about, you know, a father daughter story and in, uh, you know, I asked the, the question at the Oregon premiere, you know, of how you made the connection with Mo Montazi. And, um, uh, if you don't mind, can you kind of retell the story of, you know, when you met with, uh, Mo and his daughter on zoom and you're like, okay, yeah, hands down. Yeah, for sure. Well, we were. I was looking for somebody who is of Persian descent, who has been, you know, directly impacted by the religious revolution in 79. And there's really only two major options in wine, Dariush and Napa, who is a wonderful human. I mean, just, I want to hug him just saying his name and the Mumtazis in, at Mesara in Oregon. But the interesting thing is Dariush is very well known in the Valley. And he was who I expected to go to, but a woman named Laura Brown, who reps Mesara, um, based in Nashville, very, very smart, very talented woman. Um, I was working with her to try to do an episode on some TV of blind tasting sessions. She, she, uh, speaks American sign language and, and is a deaf interpreter and other things like that, as well as being in the wine field. And I wanted to do a blind tasting sessions because there's a very prominent, um, deaf, sommelier in nashville and i want to do blind tasting sessions with two people speaking sign language instead of i just thought it would be interesting challenging to film interesting in the way it was communicated and so we were talking about that and i still want to do that uh but during the process of that i happened to mention the film we were doing to her and i don't know why but she said look you know i i rep this i rep this winery and they're persian And you have to meet Mo. They are the sweetest people, but they are also really, really, really dedicated to making people understand what they've been through. And so I got on the Zoom with Mo and his daughter, Nassim, who I believe is like the president of sales or, and he has three daughters. 
and each one of them do something very interesting. One does events. One does one is the winemaker there, um, Tamana, and one is Nassim. And so Nassim and him got on this Zoom, and I was asking them questions, and Mo would go to answer, and Nassim would cut him off, and she would do the thing that I think a lot of daughters do with fathers, where it's like, you, you know, <laughs> you're misremembering. Let me tell you how it really happened, and it's like this kind of like daughter splaining which i find very very adorable but also really really interesting and to see a woman like nasim who's so strong and so interesting and so fascinating and then mo who's this guy who's seen more life than i will ever in five lifetimes he's done more and been through more hell and you know got one of the most beautiful families i was looking at this and i'm like this guy and the way he interacts with his children and the way he is patient with them and I have daughters. They talk to me the same way. You know, they, dad, you're wrong. Here's what happened. You didn't, you know, right. and, and to see this kind of mirror was when I realized this is a real, this is a father daughter film. It's not just a wine film. It's not a geopolitical thing. It's a story about daughters who are going to be taking over and doing a better job at what their father did. And so I think it changed the whole movie again for me where I realized really what we were making. And so that's kind of how Mesara came in and it helps that they make just an incredible wine. I mean, they make yeah. many incredible wines, but their Pinot is fantastic. And, you know, to have the wine in the film live up to how rich the story is, is a rarity, honestly. I mean, it's very, it's very tough. And so, yeah, yeah that's kind of how it happened. Yeah. That, I, I absolutely love that that story. And then, you know, there's also oh, a quote. Well, I love those guys. They're they're insane. They're insane in the best way. I mean, I really mean it. I, oh God. Mo is, yeah. uh, Mo, Mo is, uh, yeah, he's, he, he probably looks 10 years older because of those daughters. But that's, uh, right. that's, that's, that's okay. We're all there. Yes. Yes, we are. And there, there's a quote that Mo says, you know, in the movie that water separates people and wine brings them together. Yeah. That's, that was, oh, I mean, that was such a heartfelt moment. Yeah. It's a, it's a truly interesting thing because one, it's a catchy phrase, but if you're somebody who has been expelled from your country or can't go back or whatever, it has meaning that is so much deeper than just, you know, how interesting the statement is for him. You know, that's a, a very deep, deep statement that means a lot carries a lot of weight frankly it, and so yeah I, lo I love that yeah 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 it, it's a great quote um you know you talked about having two daughters and trying to manage those uh not manage <laughs> but you know live with <laughs> they manage me i think is more more uh i wouldn't trade anything being in a being in a house of all women and myself is definitely the i wouldn't change a thing it's uh stuff actually gets done that way <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Uh, you know, for me going around to Oregon, you know, I interview a lot of husband and wife teams. I bet. And, and I'm sure that, you know, you have seen that as well. And one of the questions that I always like to, to ask is, you know, what do you think the, the secret sauce, you know, is, you know, to working with your significant other and not killing them on a day, daily basis? It's a better question for my wife who probably wants to kill me on a daily basis. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that it's really, really, really important to, and I don't do the, I don't do a good enough job of this is to reflect on what you're putting the other through. And it's really important to know sometimes when you're demanding something of the other. And I think it's mostly comes from me to my wife to realize I put her in this situation. I am the one who is asking her to do something and she's not the one asking me. And I think it's really important to know who you're asking help from instead of thinking that they deserve to just have to do this for you. And I, and I know in winemaking, it's very similar. Um, John Adams who did the sound and, and so much more, I mean, on this film and his wife, Meg, they make wine in Oregon. Um, wild sound vineyards and i and i've watched them work together and seeing the way films are made and wine is made it's done in a sort of long process it's different right. if you own a convenience store and you work with your wife and one of you is going to be in there at a certain time and that that 
is probably equally as hard, but it happens, you know, in a measured thing with films and wine, you just, it's this like, what do they say about combat? It's 90% boredom and 10% utter terror. And I think that this is a similar process, you know, when you're harvesting, when you're shoot thinning, when you're, when you're doing the things that require, you know, you're dropping fruit and you're managing the vineyard all yourself or whatever you're doing, it requires a patience that you either are born with, you know, or not. And when it comes to your spouse, I look at, (laughs) this is going to be terrible analogies, but like if you're in jail and your spouse comes and visits you, you better be nice to them because they don't have to come back. And so I look at it when you're doing something like you're making wine or you're making a film and it's every film we make, somebody cares more about it, whether it's Christina or myself. And it, this can oscillate from different times, but it was always somebody's idea and whoever's idea it was bears the responsibility of being the more patient one. Because when you go through the process of this was my idea you better be nice to the person who is supporting that idea. And I think when it comes to being married to somebody, it's easy to think this is a job, but it's not, you know, this is like, you have to look back and go when I was at community college, trying to be a filmmaker and get into film school, I dreamt of being able to do this. And so when you're there and you're under the stress and the pressure of actually doing it, you have to think, it's not fair to put the pressure on the person who is doing the most to help you realize your goal. And so, you know, I think that the question you asked is a minute by minute, you have to always be reevaluating because there is no, you don't get to have the take, take this person for granted thing that you might be able to, if you're a plumber or work in heating and cooling or something where it's like, I come home and for, just this Tuesday, I just like to have a beer and I'd like to watch my show and I'd like to be left alone. You don't really get that when you're making a film or you're making wine, it's a relentless pursuit. And so you have to find the, the calm, which I'm not sure that I ever have, honestly, it's you, I'm working through it, but I can tell you about my wife who I make films with. And, um, also Jackson Myers, who's our partner who makes the films with us. It, they are the reason the film's good. So I stand up there and I do these Q and A's and yes, I was on set for the whole thing. And yes, in a lot of cases, they are my ideas originally, but those two people are the reason the film makes sense. The reason it looks good. The reason that it's received well is not because of, I had an idea four years ago. It's because these people put it in implementation. They actually made it work. And in the case of Christina, her story work is the reason it's a movie. So, you know, it's, it's how you deal with the stress in between. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really no, I, I, you can tell, you can tell us something that I deal with. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, it's, it's always, you know, good insight to, to share that information. And that, that's why I ask. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you, you, you brought up the, the jail question and, you know, and normally I only ask this when both partners are in, you know, in the same room. So, yeah. you know, if, if you get a call in the middle, in the middle of the night, uh-huh. And it's Christina saying, Hey, uh, I'm in jail. What crime has she committed? Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, she's probably calling someone else cause she's killed me, but the, uh, yeah. no, I, what crime has she committed? I don't know. She can't see very well at night. So maybe she drove into a mailbox. I don't know. She's not a, she's not a, uh, that's a really Man. good question. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm a, I'm a big uh, Cleveland Browns fan. I hope that she uh, spray painted over like a Pittsburgh Steelers sign. That would be like my, my, my hope for her. I don't know. Yeah. She's not a very crime. Uh, she's, she's safer than I am in life. So I'm not sure, yeah. but I'll tell you right yeah, now, no. I'll be the first there to bail her out. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you know, That's just a great question. I would hope, I would hope I, I you know, I, hopefully nothing huge, <laughs> but <laughs> but also I hope it's a good story, whatever it is. I'm, I'm sure. And, you know, and congratulations uh, a couple of days ago on your 15 year milestone of asking her to, right. to be your, uh, to, ma- to marry you. That's right. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, that went by fast. So, yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, you, you know, with your two girls, have you given any thought to like legacy? And, and I will tell you the reason that I asked this question 
sure. is because of Andy Lytle. Mm-hmm. You know, he has quite a a play and a, a set in his mind. You know, everything that he's doing is you know creating a legacy. You know, for for you know for his kids. And does so it just it just gets gave... to make wine. Does he does he want them to take over the business, or have you talked to him about that? Uh, not very specifically, but I mean, uh, I know his older daughter is definitely involved in uh, Lytle Barnett and Obain. You know, and I, you know, I think Especially it's Obain, it's a I hope. Think, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I wouldn't wish. I don't, I don't want this to sound pessimistic at all, but I wouldn't wish my worst enemy to make films. I mean, I'm just being very serious. It is excruciatingly difficult. It is not, um, the rewards are not where you think they come from. Um, I feel like this is a profession you have to do because you have to do it. I would honestly, if my daughter wanted to make films, I would tell her, please, God, do not do it. And maybe that's just the tough place I'm in right now with trying to figure out how to get projects done, you know, doing some TV, but honestly, Jesus, there's gotta be so many better things that are, um, everyone talks about like recession proof jobs. You're like, all right, like heating and cooling recession proof, you know, this, you could go into this, you could be, do this. Filmmaking is, there's not a, it's not even week by week proof. I mean, like there's, Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. And on top of it, nobody, until it works, nobody wants to, nobody wants to help you. And I don't mean to say that I haven't gotten, the only reason I'm here is because of all the help I've gotten. But I more mean like, it's not like you go to somebody and say, hey, I want to make a film. Their first response is like, good, have fun. I can't wait to see it. And then, but but there's not like, it's a very different process. Now, if you're built for it, and production is its own thing. If your production is a relentless, wonderful, I, I couldn't do anything else. You, you work 16 hours a day. You have long meals. You have to come up with, a, you know, solutions on your feet that are always like, if you pick the wrong decision, you could be completely ruined. And um, at least you think that in the time. And then you realize later, you know, it's not that dire. But but I I would I would certainly tell my daughters, I want you to come up with 50 other jobs before you're going to do this. And of course I'd be eating my own words because this is not how I operated and not how I did it. And so I think if somebody comes to you and says, I want to be a filmmaker, Oh God. I mean, it's not, it's not a legacy business outside of whatever people call like nepotism or something like that. But in the end, filmmaking still is in a lot of ways, like an athlete where you kind of have to do it. If you're not good at it, and you're not, you don't have the stomach for it. You know, it's, you might have a door opened and that's a huge part. It might be 75% of it, but that 25% is hard earned. So I don't know. I mean, honestly, yeah, I'd be so incredibly proud if one of my daughters wanted to go into filmmaking, but I would also try my best to make them understand what it actually is they're getting into. And truly they shouldn't listen if that's what they want to do. They should go, you know, because whatever, as I said before, filmmaking is one of these things that changes every 10 minutes. So whatever they're going to do is going to be completely different than what I'm doing now. So it's, uh, right. they shouldn't listen to my negativity on that, but that's true. yeah, I'm going uh, to plan a vineyard, tell them to be a winemaker, even though that's, a, <laughs> <laughs> that's a harder, that might be a harder profession. I don't know. <laughs> I, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, oh, okay. I hope you're okay with my tangents. I apologize. I was kind of, Oh you know, no. Using you as my uh, therapy board here. It's kind of nice. I, I love it. That's great. <laughs> okay. uh, how, when are you going to get uh, Michael Mann on like some TV? You're talking like a dream. I would kill to have him on. You know, I'm, I, I don't know that Michael Mann's a wine drinker, but I, I, I will pursue this right now. Immediately. I'm a uh, God. I watched the insider three nights ago. It's uh, right. Michael Mann is a, a very good filmmaker and everyone, if anybody from my team is listening to this, they're going to be laughing so hard that I'm talking about Michael Mann. Cause I always do it in our production meetings, but the, uh, but yeah, let's get Michael Mann on. I'm in, I think uh, right. a Chicago guy, he might be more of a beer guy, but we'll see where we'll see, we'll see where he's at. 
Well, we'll see if we can get Philippe Andre to help or something, you know? That'd be great. If it turns out Philippe Andre, <laughs> I mean, you know, he's making the Ferrari film. You never know. I mean, I know. coming out. That's an interesting, you may have hit on something there. Yeah. Well, I got some rapid fire questions and then I'll let you go. Sure. Okay. I'm okay. Ready. You can tell I'm good at short answers. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> um, normally I ask this question as favorite artist to listen to during harvest, but like mm-hmm. when you're like, doing post-production or something of that another where you can like listen to music who do you mm-hmm. who do you have cranking well there's two there's two kinds one is often when i'm doing post-production i'm trying to find music that i want to temp stuff with um and in that case you know dave brubeck probably uh jazz musician for sure okay uh yeah that'd be the answer for All sure right. uh your favorite indulgent food I love dumplings so much no. of any kind, any ethnicity, any place, but Taiwanese dumplings probably topping the charts. Mm. That would be amazing. Oh yeah. If you could choose, yeah, if you, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Um, if I could choose a superpower, what would it be? It would probably be, um, Geez, any superpower of all superpowers. It would probably be. Man, I'll turn water into wine, I suppose. Ooh, I'm going with, I'm going nice. with Jesus' superpower. Yeah. There we go. I like it. And <laughs> and finally, the, the last book you read. The last book I read, does it count if I reread a book? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I reread a uh, uh, Man, this is like a. I reread Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Oh. I just just finished it a couple nights ago. Um, that's that was the, that's a bloodbath. Yeah, it's uh, I've read it many times, but it's one of these weird, strange books. We could do a whole podcast on Blood Meridian, but um, bef- before that, I read uh, Stephen King's On Writing, his his mm. book on book on book on writing and dealing with writing in life. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's a good book too. Well, yeah, and that's that's all the questions that I have. I really appreciate you taking the time. It's been oh, fabulous. It's, it's my pleasure. Thanks for li- listening to me ramble, and thanks everybody for listening to me ramble. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very much looking forward to uh, Cup to Salvation when it you know comes out on digital, and uh, it, it will be amazing to to rewatch again. I'm looking forward to that. Oh, I can't wait. We have. We have hours and hours of, it's not bonus features. These are original pieces of content, documentaries that are going to be supplementary stuff that we were not allowed to put in the film, but we can kind of sneak through in different areas. There's a lot coming um, from, from all different aspects of that film. You wouldn't believe it's the best. It's the best ancillary content we've ever had for a movie by far. Wow. Coming well, I, to TV. I can't wait. I've been a some TV subscriber for years and, you know, constantly, constantly seeing what's new. So I, I can't wait. Thank you. Really, really does mean a lot. Seriously. Yeah, no. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining me on this flavorful voyage through the world of wine on the Wine Notes podcast. I've been your host and guide, AJ Winesettle, and it's been an absolute pleasure sharing these captivating stories with you. But alas, like the last sip of a fine vintage, our time together must end. But don't fret, my wine-loving friend. The cellar doors of the Wine Notes podcast will always remain open, waiting for you to return and explore new conversations, stories, and musings from the captivating people behind the magical world of wine. Before you go, hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and don't forget to leave a sparkly five-star review to help spread the word. Until our glasses clink again, remember to savor life's moments and let the spirit of wine and camaraderie linger on your palate. Cheers, and as always, may your wine glass be full, your heart be light, and your journey 